Hi, I'm Tyler Fultz. I'm a nuclear engineer, a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is to know nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Go ahead and give me a like and subscribe to join me on my journey to a clean energy future with nuclear. If you didn't like this video, please leave me a comment down below saying what I can do better. I'm always looking to improve. Today we're going to be looking at a video by Real Life Lore called Why Chernobyl is Still a Massive Problem Today. I see this video was released in 2019, so this clearly has nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. Now Chernobyl, um, the state of it right now is it has a new safe containment structure that was recently completed and this will actually last a hundred years. This arch shaped structure weighs about 36,000 metric tons of steel and concrete and it is built above the original sarcophagus that was built right after the accident in 1986. It's a lot more stable and a lot more of a long-term solution compared to what was in 1986. So, I mean, yes, we need to watch it, but I'm not exactly sure what they mean by still a massive problem today. Let's take a look. This video was made possible by Skillshare. Learn for free for two months with over 7 million other creators by signing up at skl.sh slash reallifelore24. Just over 33 years ago in 1986, the worst nuclear accident in history took place. So this was 2019, so before COVID, before, <laughs> before the war. Good to know for context at a nuclear power plant here in Chernobyl, located only about 60 miles north of Kiev, a city of almost 3 million people. During a late night safety test, a combination of critical reactor design flaws and human error built up to cause a massive steam explosion in nuclear reactor 4 of the power plant, which caused an open air graphite fire. Over 400 times the amount of radiation released by the Hiroshima bomb was unleashed into the atmosphere by the accident. Not a bad summary that they did. Um, it's ironic that they referred to it as a safety test because they actually defeated safety systems to prov to do that that test. But that's a little uh, that's a little crazy, and that's not what this video is about. This 400 times figure that's also true. One important thing to consider, though, is the dose rate, not total dose. The radiation from Hiroshima and Nagasaki was far more deadly since it happened all at once. I would like to compare the nuclear bombs to a tsunami that hits all at once and Chernobyl to a heavy thunderstorm that just sits for several days in a row. That thunderstorm might actually dump more tons of water than the tsunami, but it's ultimately less deadly. Also, the nuclear weapons tests in the 1950s and 1960s released far more radiation into the atmosphere than Chernobyl, but it was done in remote areas. Just something to consider. The radioactive cloud spread over the entire European continent, contaminating places as far away as the United Kingdom. But the vast majority of the radiation affected interesting to point out and that is why chernobyl was could not be covered up by the soviets because it was setting off high radiation alarms in places like sweden <laughs> communities immediately surrounding the power plant at chernobyl the radiation was so intense in certain parts of the reactor building following the explosion that an unprotected worker could receive a fatal dose in less than a minute over the coming days and weeks, 134 servicemen who responded to the fire heroically were hospitalized for acute radiation syndrome, or ARS, of whom 28 firemen and operators died within months. The Soviet army then began establishing- Those are the correct numbers. Good job. 
Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, forbidding any civilians from entering within a 30 kilometer radius around the exposed reactor that was the most severely contaminated area and evacuating everybody inside. This zone still exists in Ukraine today and is roughly the same size as Luxembourg. It was once home to 120,000 people across cities like Pripyat and Chernobyl, but it's been almost entirely uninhabited now for over 30 years. Today, exactly 197 people still choose to live inside of the exclusion zone for whatever reason. But it's not as dangerous today as it used to be. The radiation levels are significantly less than what they could have been thanks to the efforts of the... The great irony here is uh, wildlife has flourished, um, not because of the radiation, but because people have just abandoned the area. Um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of animal life has thrived in there and nature has largely reclaimed that area over the past 30 years. It's interesting. Noble liquidators back in 1986. The Soviet government called up on 600,000 people to come in and work cleaning the zone up after the disaster. It was no stretch to say that the Reactor 4 building was the most dangerous place to be at in the entire world in 1986. But that didn't stop the liquidators from constructing the sarcophagus, a giant concrete and steel tomb to lock away the most dangerous place in the world forever. The sarcophagus entombed over 200 tons of highly radioactive corium lava, 30 tons of highly contaminated... Corium is a bit of a funny term. Um, what happened was the fuel in the core melted, the cladding that surround the fuel melted, and the reactor pressure vessel itself also melted. It was that hot, and this fused together mass of molten radioactive junk has been referred to as corium. That's also what they called it in uh, the Three Mile Island accident. Dust and 16 tons of exposed uranium and plutonium. By the time that the core was sealed away inside, over 26 days worth of additional natural background radiation had already been unleashed onto the planet. There was only one problem though. The sarcophagus wasn't designed to last forever. It was only designed to last for 30 years until 2016. The liquidators had constructed the sarcophagus in as quickly a time as possible in order to minimize their own exposure and the world's exposure to the radioactive poison inside. And as a result, the building was pretty shoddy, and this is partially why Chernobyl still poses a massive problem today. Again, this all could have been avoided, even in the event of an accident, if they built a proper containment pressure vessel designed to resist that sort of material. This is why... Um, Three Mile Island doesn't require a sarcophagus because the containment vessel is still intact. It never, um, nothing ever seeped through or anything required any of these crazy uh, projects to keep it contained. Not sure what he means by today, though. Is he not going to talk about the, uh, the new safe Chernobyl building? Carrying the sarcophagus from the inside is considered to be impossible because the radiation levels inside are still estimated to be as high as 10,000 rentgens per hour. That is enough to kill you if you step inside for just three minutes. 10,000 rentgens per hour, um, that is a lot. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, now the units I'm more familiar with is REM, but they're more or less equivalent if you assume gamma dose, which is the vast majority of dose that is a threat to personnel. Um, 500 rem you're looking at a lethal dose um thousand rem you're definitely not definitely not gonna make it i think the, the 400 range is where there's like a 50 50 shot if you're gonna survive or not but yeah ten thousand per hour that's that's a lot um right when it happened that number would have been over thirty thousand and enough to fry any robot. The deterioration of the sarcophagus over the years since its construction threatened to release all of this poison back out into the world. But that wasn't the only danger. On the inside of the sarcophagus rests the Upper Biological Shield, or UBS, a concrete slab that was thrown upwards by the reactor explosion and now rests at a 15 degree angle inside of the tomb. 
It's only supported by debris, which means that it could likely collapse at some point, exacerbating the dust problem inside and possibly damaging the sarcophagus itself further, which could result in radioactive dust leaking onto the outside. So Again, that's why you need it. We need the new the new structure to um, completely surround and prevent anything like this from happening. Yeah, um, it's crazy because there's still a destroyed building in what's inside of another building now, but nothing can go in it. That's true that you can't even send drones in to do it because it's such an intense field and such an intense heat. Thing had to be done before the sarcophagus fell apart, and everybody knew it. And so, work began on a new structure that would cover the entire sarcophagus inside of it, which covered the entire reactor building inside of it, sort of like the deadliest and least pleasant nesting doll to ever exist. The new structure became known as the New Safe Confinement Building, and unlike the sarcophagus, it was designed to entomb everything inside and last for the next century, until at least 2117. It took 1,200 workers seven years and 2.15 billion euros to finish constructing, equal to about 2% of Ukraine's entire GDP in 2017. If the United States spent 2% of their GDP on a single project, this was a big project uh, funded by um, what was it called like the uh, European Reclamation Alliance or something like that. A big multinational group, which is nice. Everyone stepping in to. Uh, help um, keep the uh, disaster zone safe uh, compared to what was in 1986, which was just the Soviets and also trying to uh, keep their reputation intact. Here it's a lot more of a humanitarian effort, which is admirable. It would cost about $388 billion. As the biggest movable structure ever built, the new safe confinement was finished in 2016 and slowly rolled into place over the old unstable sarcophagus and reactor building over a period of two weeks, hopefully trapping the nightmare inside forever. About 3,000 people currently work inside and around the building today as they work to dismantle the unstable sarcophagus and eventually remove the tons of dangerous radioactive material inside of it for a safe burial somewhere else. There is no time estimate for how long this process is going to take, but it likely will last for at least a decade or more. It's still potentially highly dangerous, and workers are required to carry dosimeters to keep track of their radiation exposure at all times. If a worker's annual limit is ever reached, their site access is canceled and they're banned from returning. Potentially dangerous, sure, but to keep things in perspective, the dose rate isn't that high relative to obviously what it was. Information that's not in this original video is this survived the um, current conflict with uh, Russia in, in Ukraine. Um, Russian forces occupied the area and they even shelled the area. There were some elevated dose readings, but these monitors are designed to um, detect particulate matter, a lot of it which can be kicked up by the ground shaking from artillery fire. But the building itself completely confined and contained just from the ground around it. Um, some of which was, you know, just background because a lot there's a lot, enough natural radioactive material just in dirt and rock that's in the surrounding area in that part of Ukraine. So um, thus far, it's uh, certainly doing its job. The annual limit can be reached by spending just 12 minutes above the roof of the 1986 sarcophagus or a few hours around its chimney. The exclusion zone gives off a feeling that the disaster was contained to that area, but that's not really true. Dangerous levels of radiation were dumped all across Belarus, Ukraine, and parts of Russia, and not everybody who died as a result did so immediately. Many victims and liquidators came down with dangerous cancers later on in their lives, and the UN estimates that at least 4,000 people have actually died from cancer directly related to the accident. Other studies claim that the number is actually somewhere closer to 93,000 cancer-related deaths. Some health officials estimate that over the next... Okay, now here you have to be very careful. 
especially with the 90,000 number, but even the 4,000 number. The official death toll is 31 with the UN estimate at 50. As far as this number he's getting at though, I can kind of see where they're, they're coming from. They're looking at like an environmental effect extrapolation model. Um, and it's very difficult to quantify and you can't fingerprint the cancers to having come specifically from Chernobyl. There are so many confounding variables such as personal medical history, choices such as smoking and other environmental factors from other heavy industry that's within the area that makes it difficult to prove. Also, while this estimate sounds like a lot over the course of 30 plus years, to put it in perspective, using a similar methodology, over 110,000 people die every single year due to the existence of coal power plants, due to their effect on the environment, their um, toxic uh, release of um, particulate matter, and Yes, some of their material is radioactive. They just don't monitor it for coal. So you have to be a little careful when using these numbers. 70 years, there will be a 28% increase in cancer rates across the heavily exposed areas of Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. So the nightmare is That's far from too. over. The Ukrainian government alone is currently paying out survivors' benefits to over 35,000 families. And the economic impact in Belarus alone, where most of the radiation landed, has been estimated to sit at $301 billion more than five times the annual GDP of Belarus. The total cost of the disaster has been estimated to be at least $355 billion, but that was back in 2009, so that doesn't factor in any additional costs in the decade decades since. Considering for a moment that the 2011 Japan earthquake and tsunami and subsequent nuclear disaster at Fukushima is the most expensive disaster that's been properly calculated at a staggering $411 billion, it's likely that if the ongoing costs of Chernobyl were properly... Keep in mind the Fukushima number, um, not everyone just talks about the nuclear plant. This is one of the things that kind of bothers me. 5,000 people died from a massive 9.0 earthquake. And tsunamis devastated the entire region as well so that's where a lot of that number is coming from calculated up to today it would probably steal that number one spot despite a weird tourism boom to the area around the disaster in recent years the long-lasting effects of cancer and the ongoing confinement and demolition work at the reactor itself means that chernobyl is still a global problem and it isn't over yet it will still be anywhere between 20 and several hundred years, depending on the source you take, until the area around Chernobyl is completely safe to live around permanently again. If you came to watch this video after watching the Chernobyl miniseries on HBO, you are probably not alone. I was specifically inspired after watching the series myself to create this video and do more research into what's going on there now. Ah, that explains it. He watched this series. Okay. Yeah, I have a... I have a bit of a problem with the thesis on it being such a massive problem today. I mean, it's relative, sure, but attributing the cancer, as I already talked about the challenge there, um, maintaining any sort of confinement structure, I mean, sure, but that's no different than maintaining any large containment, like a repository for propane or natural gas or something like that, where there's a much bigger risk of it exploding or <laughs> anything bad, bad like that happening. So I don't consider it a massive problem today. Um, yeah, long-term storage would be, would be nice, but those numbers that are difficult to prove, I'm... One of the most common questions that I get asked all of the time though, is how I got started. And now we get into their paid sponsor. Okay. Um, let me know what you think about, do you think, do you consider Chernobyl a massive problem today, a medium-sized problem, a solvable problem, an unsolvable problem? Let me know down in the comments of what your thoughts are, but just compared to what I know and what I think about what's a big problem associated with nuclear and what isn't, um, 
I, I wouldn't call this a massive problem. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.